All right, so tonight is going to be a very special topic. We're going to be talking about love at first sight. And you may wonder why. It's definitely a topic that many people are fascinated by. But that's not the reason I chose to speak about it. I think it's important to discuss this on a deeper level, since many people are confused. It is very much misunderstood what exactly is love. Love is a powerful force. I think everybody agrees with that. And because it's powerful, it could bring tremendous amount of pleasure, but it could also bring tremendous amount of pain. So, when talking about love at first sight, if you want a short answer, the answer is no. It's not possible for there to be love at first sight. And the simple reason is because you cannot love someone that you don't know. Very simple. You have yet to discover what he or she is all about. So how could you love them? So many times people use the word love in a wrong way. They're definitely feeling or experiencing something, obviously. They're not lying, they're not making it up. But it's not called love. You don't know the person. You don't even know yourself. Most people don't even know themselves. So therefore, they don't even know what they are feeling. What are these feelings that I'm having right now? Very strong feelings. I've never had them before. That's what many say. And I'm feeling this now, and they're so intense. And I think they're real. She is the one, the soulmate, the one I've been dreaming, the one I've been praying for. But it, it may turn out to be that you will marry him or her. Yes, it's possible. Everything is possible. You know, God brings people in all kinds of ways. And it may happen that you just somehow liked him or her the first time you were very impressed and you end up getting married. But that in itself, what you're seeing, what you're feeling, is not an indicator that you can trust 100%. The reason why people are not so sure, even though they claim they, they're sure, is because there's some confusion as a result of the human being being half animal and half spiritual. We're all endowed with the neshama, the spiritual soul. And we also have physical drives. So we're sometimes confused. What exactly are we feeling? Is this something physical or is it something spiritual? It does make a difference. But it also lends to the confusion. What exactly are we feeling right now when we see someone that we think we like? We're all familiar with the senses, the physical senses. But not, ev not everyone understands that there are another substratum of senses that is not easily perceived. We know about them, but we don't really understand them as well. The regular physical senses we know, but there's something else that we sometimes feel that is not the typical. These kind of feelings that we feel sometimes have to do with our emotions. And sometimes our emotions are colored our perception is colored because of these unique type of feelings, let's call them, very, very different than the usual, that cannot be explained in the regular way. So what are these feelings? So let's begin with the first one. I think most of you heard of passion, or in Farsi, eshk. I think in Turkish also, in Arabic, they have similar descriptions of what passion is. So, what is passion? <laughs> passion is powerful. But passion, in simpler words, is a physical attraction. That's all it is. You are physically attracted to someone. And yes, that's just a fact that some people are physically attracted to others. Men are physically attracted to women. Yes, this exists. It always has been. But is this love? No. It's a type of strong feeling that we call passion. And it's completely physical. Is it good to have it? Yes. But this is not enduring love. It's good to have. But this is not enduring love. This is not something that will necessarily last forever. 
Now what is it? It's a partial connection. It definitely is. It's good if it's there. What's wrong with passion is that it disguises. It's a disguise. You can easily disguise our true feelings. What are we really feeling for that person? If you have passion for someone, maybe you're not feeling what you're supposed to be feeling. In other words, you want to make a decision. You want to judge if this is something right for you or not. But the passion sometimes gets in the way. So passion is good, it's healthy, but it can disguise the true feelings that you're supposed to have. Why do people like it? It's very simple, it brings pleasure. Again, it's physical, and it does contribute towards the feeling of pleasure. It feels good. Then we have compassion. I think that's also something that we're all familiar with. Hopefully we all have a little bit of it. Compassion for, for others who are in need, the poor. But you have to be careful. Even though compassion is something very special, to be compassionate, this is not love. Be careful with it. You're not necessarily going to marry someone just because you feel for them. They may not be right for you. So it's definitely something good. It's real. It's strong. It's admirable, and it's definitely something that we need to develop. It is definitely a virtue, but this in itself is still not love. Then we have one of the favorite that people like to talk about, even though they totally misunderstand it, and that's called chemistry. Mm -hmm. We just have chemistry. Mm -hmm. What's chemistry? Chemistry is chemicals. <laughs> You definitely are sensing some chemicals in your body. Sure. There's something working in the brains, in the heart, that is called by some chemicals. But what chemistry really is, is that you somehow get along with someone. You feel that you can get along with them. You feel good with them. You feel comfortable with them. It's just a fact. It's a real fact. And I talk a lot about this in the topic of astrology that some people have more chemistry than others. Very, very simple. You will notice that in life, you may not necessarily have too much to do with him or her, but you somehow feel that there is good or bad chemistry for some reason and you don't even know why. So where does the chemistry come from? There's various sources of why we feel a certain type of chemistry. One is spiritual. The Kabbalah teaches how certain Individuals belong to the same root of the soul. The same Shoresh and Neshama. Soulmates, real soulmates. And therefore, they somehow sense it. They don't even know what they're feeling, but it is spiritual. It is pure. They don't know, but that's, their, that's what they're feeling. It could also be on a lower level, spiritual connection, because their names are the same. The Kabbalah even teaches this. If two people have the exact same Hebrew name, I don't know about the English names, somehow they will feel a certain affinity for each other. Affinity. There was some connection. I'm not talking yet about love, but they will sense a certain closeness because their names are the same. It's interesting. However, one of the most powerful chemistries, besides the one from the soul, is astrology. And this is also a very big topic. I have lectures about every single sign. If you want a little bit of a better understanding of what astrology is, we're not talking about predicting the future. We're talking about Jewish astrology that puts an emphasis on human nature. Why is it that certain people behave in different ways? People behave differently. They have different characteristics, different personalities. It has to do with one's mazal, one's astrology. And the affinity that these signs create, or the lack of affinity that exists between the signs, is what produces compatibility or a lack of compatibility. Are two individuals compatible or not will depend on their nature. Of course it depends on their values as well, on their background. There's a lot of things that contribute towards where, whether people will get along or not. I'm pointing out this because 
I've noticed it a lot, I've spoken a lot about it, and this is something that not everyone speaks about. You have to understand that the astrology behind chemistry, it is real. It's a fact. It can be proven that you will get along with certain people more than with others. And with some, you will not enjoy being around. Then, there's also chemicals that are triggered by what you see. You see something. It appears beautiful. Usually, it is beautiful. And it triggers that beauty, what you see, triggers some other kinds of chemicals in the body. There's definitely something going on in the body that tr triggers these chemicals that makes you all of a sudden be fascinated or even obsessed with the individual. Now, this is a danger zone. <laughs> on this, Solomon says in Mishlei, in Proverbs, be careful. If you're going to be judging by outside appearances, be very careful. It's deceiving. Because grace or charm is false. Don't go by it. And beauty is heavy, is futile, or as they say in English, I think, skin dip, you know, it's only beauty. There is even a more powerful mashal that the rabbis gave, a more powerful uh, example or saying. Be careful never to judge a person by his outer appearance. Don't judge the jug by the way it appears. Oh, it's so beautiful. It's gold, isn't it? No, no, sir. It's just painted gold. It's not real gold. It's fake. Look at the inside. Look at the content. That's more important than the outside appearance because people will sell you or people will convince you to buy something because of its outside appearance. Her father has a lot of money. That's not beauty, but it's also something external. Are you going to share the life with someone just because of their money? You know, money comes and goes. And even if it doesn't go away, even though the money may remain, are you married to the money or do you want to marry her because of her values, because of her personality? You want it to endure. You don't want to get divorced quickly. So money will not keep the marriage necessarily together for too long. So that is what the rabbis told us. Be careful when you judge people. Don't be misled. Don't be carried away by that which is external, that which is physical. Look at the inside of the jug. What's inside? Is it pure orange juice or is it from concentrate? <laughs> is it the real thing? What's the real thing? Ishayirat Hashem, a God-fearing woman. She's a righteous woman. She will be the best mother of your children. Isn't that what you want? Not everybody knows this. They think they're just marrying someone who will be a good companion. No, 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 no. Be careful on how you judge people. That is why when it comes to soulmates, God has to be involved. He knows the souls. He knows who goes with whom. But sometimes we tell God, unfortunately, God, leave it to us. We know better. There's money, there's beauty, but these are external things and these are not what you want to judge as potential for marriage. It's good if there's beauty, it's definitely nice if there's grace, but don't just base your decision on that. Then we have something called nostalgia. When people long for the good old days or for familiar surroundings, in Portuguese, there's a special word for this called saudades. I don't know if it in any other language. It's when you have a longing for something that you feel very attached to, that you miss it so much. These are also powerful feelings, very powerful and real, but it doesn't have too much substance. All it is is memories, a certain attachment. It's definitely an attachment, but these are not the most powerful feelings that we're going to be talking about. Real love. But it's something. All of this that I just mentioned, by the way, it will feel good 
it will feel comfortable and it will give you perhaps a certain secure feeling and that is why people sometimes are satisfied with this it gives them a sense of security but it's not it's definitely not secure what is something that we can all agree on that is a secure feeling something that really really will give you that secure feeling trust can you trust them this is a truly secure feeling if you can trust them and why do you think Shalomah Melech in the very beginning of chapter 31 says you know who is a woman of valor who is the ideal wife he goes on to list all the good qualities but they're one of the first ones in the very beginning that he mentions the husband can trust her with his eyes closed I read somewhere that it's a greater compliment if somebody trusts you than he loves you. It's a much greater compliment if somebody tells you, I trust you, mm -hmm. than he tells you, I love you. Because remember, the word love is not always real. So, what happens with trust? Trust, you can't trust the person you just met. Trust is something that takes a lot of work and a lot of time to develop. You need to build trust. And it may take a couple of years to build it. But you know what? Unfortunately, it could take a second to break. It could have been there. People have had it. But it was lost in a second. What took years to build can be lost in a second. And then it could take a lifetime to repair. To repair trust can be very, very difficult. It's possible, but it's difficult. So trust is definitely something that is very, very powerful, something that is necessary, we can't do without. Here we're not talking about necessarily friendship, which also needs trust. I'm using this as an example in marriage. Love, where marriage is definitely built on that. I mean. Hopefully, if, if the two of them want to have a solid relationship, uh, enduring relationship, it will be based on many important components, trust being one of them. But even with friendship, in all kinds of relationships, trust is valuable. All right, then somebody will come and ask, well, wait a minute, Rabbi, why do you say trust is so important? I've heard the famous Latin saying, Omnia vincit amor, love conquers all. Have you heard that one? Mm -hmm. Love, rabbi, not trust. Love conquers all. <laughs> if you have love, that takes care of everything, doesn't it? Who says you need trust? Does love conquer all? The answer is real love, yes. The problem is that not everybody has real love. If it's real love, then it could conquer all. What, what is an example of love that conquers all? I think a good example would be the verse in Mishlei that says as follows, Hatred produces or begets quarrels. When people don't like each other or they have something against you, they can easily quarrel with you. It's just fertile ground. Husband and wife, if there is animosity between them, they will quarrel all that because that animosity, that sin'ah, that hatred, it just produces quarrels. But love covers up all faults. Real love. Real love covers up all faults. What does that mean? If you have the wife or the husband making a mistake, they made a mistake and uh, the husband points it out or the wife points it out and they continuously bring it up again and again and again remember you did this last time remember you did this cover it up if you're interested in having a loving relationship if you really love someone you don't bring up their faults you don't remind them you don't mention them again and again you could say, perhaps next time be a little bit more careful, that's fine. 
Our kol peshain techaseh hava means that if you are pursuing love, then you have to be prepared to cover up. This kind of covering up the fault is indicative of somebody who wants to love. This is real love. He wants to love. Okay? But one who continuously brings up the faults, then that's not love. That is what there is a saying. You know how you know who a true friend is? A true friend is one who knows you with all your faults and still loves you. So a true loving relationship, husband and wife, can be real love if they know each other's faults and they still love each other. They don't point them out. Oh, you're like this, right? Your mother's like that too. You know, imagine it gets worse <laughs> and then they go to the grandmother. <laughs> be careful. This is animosity. This is not love. Don't point out a person's fault. Hopefully they are aware of it. Why point it out? If you point it out, that means you're not interested in loving them. If you cover them up, ignore them, and you are forgiving of them, that is a sign that you are in love with them or that you're looking to love them. There's another very nice verse <coughs> also in Mishlei. Neimanim pitzei ohev. The wounds of a good friend who loves you are nemanim, are trusted. But the kisses of an enemy are burdensome. You know, there are people when they see each other, they kiss themselves three times on the cheek. Have you seen that? Cheek one, cheek two, cheek three, right? Yeah. All these kisses, it's not real. And pleasantries, it's all fake. It's not real love or friendship. Yeah. So they're burdensome. Some people say, oh, I'd rather him not kiss me. No, I don't want his kisses. You know, I have to go wipe my cheeks now. And look at the opposite. Pitzel have the wounds, the wounds of a friend. What wounds? The rebuke. He rebuked you. He told you off. He pointed to your mistake. He said where you were wrong. But they came from a good friend that you can trust them. They're neemanim. You're better off getting that constructive criticism from a good friend. Even though it's criticism, it's painful. It's hard to hear. But it's neemanim. They're trusted. They're good. They're probably right. You need to hear them. And you're not going to hear it from just anyone. From your friend, you're probably going to hear it. Or at least there's a better chance. That's much better than the kiss from a sonair, from an enemy, you know, somebody you don't like. So what is real love? Real love is what the rabbis tell us. Ahava shelot luya bedavar. Love that is unconditional, that does not depend on any physical aspect to sustain it. Ahava shelot luya bedavar. In other words, the love is there. It has grown, of course. It has taken time to grow. But it's not dependent and money, beauty, intelligence, nothing physical. It has developed somehow, because the two of them, of course, worked on developing it. They both wanted it. So what's fake love? Instead of calling it fake, I like to call it make-believe. It's a make-believe love. They think they're in love. It's make-believe love. It depends on something. It depends on the passion, it depends on the looks, it depends on all these external aspects that are not really indicators of love. Yes, it's true. Sometimes there's a tremendous amount of excitement, but that's still physical. That excitement between the two people is a physical excitement. And what happens with physical excitement, it diminishes with time, with everybody. Respect doesn't necessarily diminish. Trust does not diminish, hopefully, but physical excitement, passion, with time you get used to each other, it's not as exciting as it was during your honeymoon. Okay, if that's the case, getting back to our original question, if two people see each other and they, they think they're observing love at first sight, it's not love at first sight, then what is it? I think the best way to describe what you're seeing the first time is how in Spanish we say about people that we like or dislike. Me cae bien o me cae gordo. 
and it's a little funny. I don't know an English translation for it. It's basically the perception that I have of him is that he's obnoxious. I dislike him. You haven't even spoken to him. You don't even know him. Why are you saying he's obnoxious? Why are you saying you dislike him? Because that's the feeling you get with some people that in Spanish we say, me cae gordo. Now, even though me cae gordo means, literally means that he's very heavy, fat <laughs> for me. In other words, the feeling is not a pleasant feeling. This could be true even after you've known him for a while. But it could also be true even the first time around. When you see him, your impression is you dislike him or me cae bien. I like him. I see something that is pleasant. He is agreeable with me. I can see ourselves getting along just fine. And this is even before you communicate it, because communication obviously is going to be important too. Can you communicate well? Do you share things in common? Do you enjoy being together? All of this has to do with what we said earlier. A certain chemistry that could be because of the astrology, and many times it is. That's all it is. When people say they are attracted, they feel good with each other, it's pleasant, it's comfortable, it feels good, it's the astrology that makes them compatible, which is fine. I mean, ultimately, you want to be friends with certain people, you're going to be friends with those that you like. I mean, it would be nice for you to be friends with everybody, but it's not possible. You can choose. Just make sure that once you choose to be your friends, that you relate to them properly. You know, a lot of people make friends quickly, but they lose them quickly too. They don't know what it takes to be a friend. But they still have those feelings. They are still going to have those feelings of comfort, that it's pleasant with certain people more than with others. So that's from astrology. So yes, you will notice certain things, and they are real, but it's not love. It's compatibility. It feels good. So what exactly is love then? that is unconditional, that we said before is real love. What's involved in that kind of a love? <clears throat> the Kabbalah teaches that in the Hebrew language, we get a feeling for what real love involves. Ahava, as it is called in Hebrew, is from the root hav, to give. So the root of real love involves the act of giving, whereas passion is the act of receiving. This is for me. This is something that I'm going to enjoy. I'm attracted to this. You see the difference? Whereas the act of love is the act of giving to someone else, to care for them. A very different kind of idea that most people may have perhaps been familiar with. Be careful that it's not about yourself. If you really want to love someone, then you want to give to them. Why? Because giving, Judaism teaches, creates a bond, a kesher, a connection, a strong one. So much so that if people received something, normal people, they feel grateful. They want to thank you for it. They feel a certain connection. I said normal people. A lot of people, unfortunately, are ungrateful. They don't recognize it. They ignore it. I'm not talking about that. It is only normal for a person to feel grateful, happy. You've connected with him, not just with a handshake, which is also a connection. Not just with a phone call, which is also a connection. You've given him something. You could have given him money, help. You could have given him encouragement. That's also an act of giving. Sometimes words of encouragement do a lot more to people than the money that you give them. They needed that even more than the money. Regardless, the act of giving is powerful. That is why real love involves giving. How do we know this? Where can we see this, that it involves the act of giving? Where do we see this? When you have children, you will only see real love the moment you have a child. Because you will give to your children. And you will love your children more than your children will love you. Why? Because you give to them. They don't give to you. You see what I mean? That is where you see a good example 
of love that involves giving the love for a child. Because of that, because there's a certain love and concern for one's children, the rabbis tell us when you're choosing a chazam, a cantor for the days of all, Yamim Noraim, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, ideally, choose one who has children. Why? Because he will think about them too. He will think about his kids, that they should have a good year. He will hopefully think about the entire congregation. His prayer will be more sincere. He'll have compassion. If he does not have children yet, he might be a nice person, but he has not yet developed that feeling that he would have only if he would have his own children. You see the logic here? Yeah. Okay, then we're talking about a very, very pure love indeed. The love for children, the desire to give. Where does this come from? Are we born with it? Do we develop it? Do we learn it? Part of it is in us, in our neshama, in our soul. Hashem is like that. God loves us. God loves us so much, He gave us life. That's what the Kabbalah teaches. He created the world as an act of love. Pure love. God has no interest, no need for this world. Why, why create a world? Who needs this world? Everybody's always fighting. Wars. It's an act of love. God is the source of all goodness of all love. So therefore, it is the nature of goodness to do good, to want to help, to want to give. That quality that we call love comes from Hashem, the one that's pure love, real love. It comes from Him, and He gives it to us. It's embedded in our neshama. It's not developed, it's not mature, but it's there in potential. Therefore, since it's there in potential, Everyone is capable of it. No one should say, I cannot love. That's not true. You can love. You have a soul. You have a divine spark in you. And that is why Seneca, have you ever heard of him? Seneca, famous Roman philosopher. He said that love in its essence is a spiritual fire. It's a spiritual fire. It's a fire but it's spiritual, not physical, real love. But, even though it's there, it will take time to develop. One needs to work on developing this love. It will not happen by itself. Why won't it happen by itself? Because this love, even though we understand it, realize its importance, it is flawed. You know what flawed means? It's never perfect 100%, usually not. And the reason why it's not perfect, why it's flawed, is because human beings are flawed. Human beings are imperfect. So if the human being is imperfect, if he has imperfections, then he's going to have a hard time. He's going to struggle developing that pure love that he has in potential because of his flaws. So therefore, because people have flaws, the only way to overcome these flaws is to work on one's midot, to refine one's character. That is the place to begin. If people have certain issues, whether it's stinginess, anger management, laziness, these are all flaws, weaknesses. It's going to be harder for them to love someone selflessly, completely. They might like someone, perhaps even respect them a little bit, but to really love, as you're going to see soon, it takes a lot. To demonstrate real love, it requires a lot of, of ourselves. It's their potential, but not everyone develops it to its full potential. And therefore, it's imperfect. A lot of relationships suffer because of the imperfections in their love. Yes, they say yeah, that we love each other, but it's not 100%. It's flawed. It's not perfect. For love to be strong, to be constant, it requires certain components. One of the most important components is commitment. Without commitment, it just won't last. You need to commit. It may involve sacrifice. Are you willing to sacrifice? Sometimes you have to give up your job. Sometimes you may have to give up an hour of your time. Sometimes you may have to give up a lot of money. But for this person that you love, Hopefully you will do it. Sacrifice. 
the Jewish people were prepared to sacrifice their lives for Hashem. Because they knew this is real. Their emunah, their faith or love for Hashem was pure. It involved sacrifice sometimes. And number three, devotion. You need to be devoted, dedicated. Do for the other person. Even though you say to yourself, well, they're not doing so much for me. So what? Don't start counting what she did for you, what he did for you. Remember, you want to build this relationship, so you have to focus on giving. What happens in real life is that people have a hard time with these three. There's more. I just gave you three examples, three components that I believe are from the most important ones, that without them, it will not succeed. There has to be commitment. The two of them are getting married. They're going underneath the chuppah. They're saying, yes, I do. I think in English that's what they say. In Judaism, the groom puts the ring on the finger of the kala and says the words that you are sanctifying to me and to no one else. <laughs> so hopefully, what are the two thinking at that moment? We want this to last. We want this to succeed. They're not thinking of divorce, hopefully not. But they need to realize that in order to, to practice what you preach, it's going to involve commitment, sacrifice, and devotion. Without that, the new words are empty words. So these conditions that I just mentioned, commitment, sacrifice, and devotion, is what's necessary for a successful marriage, friendship, and our relationship with God. Without any one of those three, it won't work. Rabbis tell us, therefore, something incredible. Mishe chaser lo more or less. Whoever has a hard time forming friendships, he's going to have a hard time forming a relationship with God. With human beings, you cannot get along. You're having a hard time forming a friendship. Even with one friend, you can't give to even one individual, to one human being. Then how do you expect to love God who you don't even see? Even though he's been so kind to you, even though he's given you so much, but you're having a hard time because you haven't developed those midot, those qualities that are necessary for a lasting relationship, lasting connection. Commitment. Are you prepared to commit? Some people have a hard time with commitment. They just don't want to commit. Look at all the people that don't want to get married today. I'm not talking about the ones who are, who are still single. Not willing they'll get married too. Because they want to. You have to want to. But some people don't want it. They don't want the responsibility. They'd rather have a dog. Yeah. And then I wonder why people have two and three dogs. Wow. You must be a great parent in potential. You can handle three dogs, then you can handle children too. Why not? But anyway, this is a whole different topic. And I've spoken in other lectures about marriage. And so we're not going to get too much into the details of why some people want to get married, some people do not want to get married, but part of it has to do with a lack of wanting to make a commitment. Sacrifice, devotion also doesn't come easy to everyone. But when it comes to marriage, marriage is unique. It's very different than friendship for a very important reason. The Torah tells us that part of getting married is not just about reproducing, that too. But it's an ezer kenegdo. When God created the man and the woman, the intent there was that each one should complement each other, should help each other. The two of them will grow together. The man and the woman alone are half. They cannot accomplish everything in this world. They need each other. These are key words. You need each other, not that you want each other. A lot of times people go on a date and they like what they see, because this is what they were dreaming of, that this is what they wanted. No, sir, if this is marriage, it should be, this is what I need. Now, we don't always know what we need. As, we, as I said earlier, we don't know ourselves. But that should be the focus, at least partially. Can she be that mother of my children? Can she help me in my areas that I'm weak in? Can I help her? We don't know the answer to that question, but at least we can ask it and we can investigate a little bit, we can ask other people. It's not what we want. God will give us, hopefully, 
what we need. He will designate the right person, whether it's the real soulmate or someone else. It makes no difference. But it will be someone that will hopefully complement us. It will be an Ezek and a dog. This does not mean in any way that the right soulmates will for sure succeed, and I'm going to talk about that soon. Even though they're soulmates, they were designated for each other, unfortunately they are divorces even with the best of couples. So don't misunderstand me. It helps a lot when people are really for each other. It's so nice and beautiful, the potential is there. But human beings are human beings. And even though you give them everything in the world, they can ruin it. So when it comes to marriage, yes, it's very unique. It's a special kind of relationship. But in order to make it work, you need the right ingredients. Well, if they're soulmates, don't they have the right ingredients? Yes, but they may not know how to cook. <laughs> you can have all the right ingredients, yes, but you have to know how to cook. The reason I use this example is because the right ingredients is the requirements that we mentioned before, whether it's commitment, whether it's being respectful, these are all good ingredients. But you have to know how to cook, you have to know how to deal with problems. You have to know that sometimes you need to consult with someone if a problem arises. You can't handle everything yourself. You need to therefore ask, seek advice. You need to get direction. So not everybody just knows how to cook by themselves. Some people do. I have seen that people who did not have too much direction Somehow they got along just fine. They're, they're so nice. They're nice to each other. They're respectful. They're lucky. But some people are so different. Men and women are so different to begin with. Now you expect them to live under the same roof <laughs> and do for each other? It's not so easy. So don't assume just because you're so excited about him or her that this is for sure going to work. There may be some baggage there. So you need to have the right ingredients, plus you have to know how to cook. So part of having the right ingredients is refining one's character. Because if you still have those characteristics that are difficult, and you're going to bring them along to the marriage, it's not going to work so easily. One who does develop his character, one who works on his midot, refines his character, he will be capable of something called altruism. Most people don't know what altruism is. Altruism is selfless love, caring for another individual, only because you want to do for them without any other ulterior motives. That's called altruistic love, pure as can be. It can only be if somebody is really of a noble character. Really, he doesn't care as much about himself. He's definitely not selfish. He's selfless. It can only be that someone who works on his character, controls his appetites, does not think of himself, that is capable of altruism. All right, so let's assume people love each other. They care for each other, they respect each other. How about expressing love? People have different ways of expressing that love. Some people are very talkative, some people buy gifts. That's fine, people are different. That also has to do a little bit with their astrological sign, how they express their love. But how do you know, or how can you be convinced that he really loves you? <laughs> He's expressing his love in his way to you. I don't care for the balloons. He bought you balloons for your birthday. That's his way of expressing it. He wrote you a card, but he didn't buy you a gift. But he really means it. That was his way of expressing. But how do you know? How can you be convinced? A lot of people are very unhappy because they have certain expectations. Okay? Supposedly, they love each other, but they're disappointed. And these disappointments sometimes creep up in life because of expectations. Why are you having these expectations? But maybe he has a different way of expressing his love for you. He doesn't talk to me. Well, maybe he's the quiet type. <laughs> you know, he may love you dearly. And by the way, this happens a lot with fathers and sons. 
A father loves his son usually very, very much, even though he doesn't show it. Men are not as expressive as women are. Women have that compassion to remember. So you, what you see is not necessarily what, the reality. That father may really, really love you very much, but he didn't say it. So people are different in how they express their love. So how do you know? Is there any indicator that you can trust that he really loves you? If we're talking about expressing affection, well, obviously that's important. That is some sort of indicator. If he didn't do anything, it would be a problem. So what we said earlier is definitely an indicator. One who's forgiving. You made a mistake, he forgives you. He covers it up. He doesn't try to bring it up. That in itself is also a very good indicator. I mean, ultimately, if people just choose to fight about everything, I don't think this is a loving relationship. I mean, it's obvious not. People who go to great lengths to cover up and to forgive, and let's forget, don't worry about it. They reassure each other. That's very, very positive. But ultimately, what will determine if he or she loves you will be the following. They show concern, responsibility, respect, understanding, and they desire for you to succeed and to grow. They really care about you. These are just some examples. There's more. These are the few that I thought about, that I've seen others write about. A lot of experts, by the way, have written many articles about some of these qualities that should be present there. They definitely make the difference, and they serve as indicators whether this is a healthy relationship or not. But let me warn you of something, and this is where Judaism can help. It is very easy for the husband to show his wife respect, love, attention, but it's not real. You know when you can tell if it's real or not? When they're not physical, when she's an Ida, during the menstruation period when Jews are forbidden, men and women, the married couple, are forbidden from being together intimately for a number of days. He can't touch her. Forget about kissing and intimacy. He can't even touch her. That is the time when you can test this, whether he will still respect you, help you in the kitchen, help you with the kids, help you in the house, be there for you when there's no physical contact. In the non-Jewish world, I don't know how we would be able to test this when there's no physical contact. I guess if they, if they somehow did not have physical contact for a while and the wife was able to see that her husband was really there for her. And the other way around, the husband saw that the wife was always there for him. There are situations where you can judge this. I just used this example because for 12 days, not being together approximately, this could be a good test, especially when we're talking about a young couple who is usually more physical than an older couple. But even for an older couple, I mean, it is possible to test this during certain times more than in others. Does he do everything he can for you? Does he give it all for you? In other words, has he really tried his best? Or does he just try a little bit? Tries to get by, tries to get away with it. You can really see if he's doing his most, his utmost, to please you or not. Now let's talk momentarily about infatuation. Have you heard about that one? Some people are obsessed with the, with the woman, or she is obsessed with the man of her dreams. They're obsessed. It's called infatuation. You know what this is? This is a blind love. You may have heard this. Love is blind. This kind of love is for sure blind, infatuation. They're crazy about each other. Be careful with that because that's really blind. Anytime you have this kind of feelings, you should know they will easily lead to resentment and disappointment. When eventually when you see that this is not exactly what you thought. So not only will it just slow down and disappear, it actually will lead to tremendous pain, resentment disappointment. But the sad part of all of this is that even if it was real, a solid marriage, sometimes there's disappointments. So even though we're not going to get into all the reasons of why this happens, 
I definitely think it's a good idea to mention some of the more important ones that have the capability of ruining an otherwise good relationship. Trust issues, issues of trust. One or the other cheats on the other. That is a big problem in most societies. Trust issues, different expectations, as we mentioned earlier, they have different kinds of expectations and things are not the way they thought they would be. Communication issues, this is also a problem. They don't communicate. It is an art to know how to communicate. It really is something that you need to learn. Some people are just naturally gifted and they know how to communicate. The problem is that some are so good in communicating that they're not sincere. <laughs> they just know how to sell themselves. I think sooner or later the wife will figure it out. <laughs> but still, communication is very important. That's something that we fail to do a lot, even the best of us don't communicate enough. And the women especially are hungry for that attention much more than the men. And the husband doesn't even realize how important it is. He just thinks, oh, she's always complaining. She's not complaining, she's really hurting. She needs this. And sometimes we don't pay attention to that. So communication is very important. So if there's communication issues between them, that can also lead to divorce. Then, of course, there's abuse, God forbid, when the husband abuses the wife physically, verbally, or she abuses the husband. Verbal or physical abuse is destructive, very destructive. The problem is, as I've, I've spoken about this in the past, when too much of this happens over time, then the scars that it leaves are never healed. If you ever did get into a disagreement, just make up before you go to sleep that night. Don't let it sit. It happens that we sometimes argue. It happens that we disagree. That's okay. Just make sure you make up. Don't let it sit, because if they never heal those scars, when you go to a marriage concert, 10 years down the road, your feelings for them have been lost, for her or for him. They can't restore those good feelings. The scars are still there. Even though they forgive each other, okay. Let's start from scratch. No, how could you start from scratch? You've lost the feelings. It's still possible, but it takes too much work. As I said before, if the trust was lost, to repair it will take a lifetime. So be careful with abuse, very careful. Then there's addiction. Sometimes a man, a woman, has a certain addiction, whether it's drugs, alcohol, that could also ruin a very good relationship. They had all the ingredients there, but he became an addict. Selfishness could be definitely a problem. And one of the sad ones is money issues. Some people just don't know how to handle problems with money. They're having a problem, they're struggling, making ends meet. The husband's out of a job and the wife cannot handle it properly. She doesn't have the right outlook. What does this mean? Why are we going through this hardship? She may come to the point of looking down at her husband. You're good for nothing. You don't know how to find yourself a job. Look, you're always fired. She doesn't understand perhaps that it's not his fault. There's something called Masal too. People have to be very careful. If you have any doubts, ask a very informed rabbi who knows about these things. Why is he really struggling? Is it really that he perhaps lazy or doesn't want to work? Maybe he's depressed and he's not telling you. So money issues could be a big problem. So you have to be careful that if the relationship is otherwise good, you, know, you have to be forgiving. You have to try your best. Perhaps you get yourself a job and help your husband. You're supposed to help each other. What happens when there's too many things going on that are negative is that the couple will grow apart. They will drift. It's very hard to later bring them back together. So you have to watch out for these things. So what can be done to preserve the relationship, to have a truly loving relationship? You have to nourish it. Get good advice in counseling early. Don't wait till it's late. You need to nourish it. You need to take walks together, whatever it takes to nourish it. There's a lot of good advice out there on how to nourish a relationship. We all have to do it. 
Imagine a beautiful plant that you just bought for $150. You better water it. You better take care of it. It's going to dry up. It won't just live by itself. It needs to be nourished. In the relationship, love, love needs to be nourished. I just realized something very interesting today. I was preparing this topic, and all of you are familiar with the custom that underneath the chuppah, the groom and the wife are standing, right? Underneath the chuppah, they get ready to get married. And there's a custom, a Jewish custom, of that the husband breaks a glass underneath the chuppah to remember Jerusalem. In other words, our happiness is not complete. Even though we're about to build our home, but God's home, the temple, is not built yet. That's the source of that custom. We tell God, thank you very much for this most happiest day in our life, but it's incomplete if your home is not built yet, so we should not forget. But I thought of another idea behind that breaking of the glass. Why does a husband give his wife a diamond ring? Why not topaz? I like emeralds, by the way. Why not those stones? Why a diamond? You know why? Because diamonds are forever. And perhaps what the husband is telling his wife, I want you forever. I want this relationship to be an enduring relationship. Diamonds are forever. Let this relationship therefore be forever. Oh, if that's the case, now perhaps we can say that the breaking of the glass also symbolizes, yes, even though it can be forever, but it's fragile like a glass. You see how I'm breaking the glass? This forever is fragile. It could easily break. Let's both be careful. But why a glass? Because a glass is a receptacle that will receive all those blessings from God. He will help us. You need a receptacle. You want to receive all the blessings. You want His help. You have to make a receptacle. That is why we have this glass. But this glass can break. So the potential is there. But it could easily, God forbid, break. So what's the trick of being careful not to break the glass? Is sustain the relationship. Do whatever it takes to sustain it. Because the fact that you met each other is very special. That's also an act of God. But now it's going to be up to you to sustain it. If there is a pure love that it was developed between the two, it will be sustained. Now I'm going to reveal to you something else. You know how you say love in Chinese? In Japanese? In Chinese, love is I. And in Japanese, it's I. What does that tell you? What does it sound like? It sounds like either amazement, surprise, or I, that it hurts. And in Yiddish, it's ay ay ay. In other words, <laughs> this love that was once pure and strong it could be ay ay ay. It could be very, very painful. Be careful. Be very careful with it. I'm just going to give you there for one piece of advice. Even though, and there's other lectures that discuss this more at length, I'm going to give you just one advice. Misunderstandings take a toll. They do. Misunderstandings take a tremendous toll on any relationship. It would be a good idea for people from time to time to write letters to each other. Not just a birthday card. Writing expresses a deeper part of yourself. You can come across in a deeper way your sentiments, your feelings. A letter can be reread many, many times, again and again. Words are forgotten. If what you've said is so special, put in the writing. Let him or her have that letter. So here we're talking about communication being very important, but written communication can be very powerful. Write a letter occasionally and express sincerely. Hopefully that will bring out the deeper feelings that we have if we put into writing. Just to end, I want to remind everyone that life is a journey. And at the end of this journey, God willing, we will be awarded medals, depending how we did. The most important medal is if we did more for others than we did for ourselves. Let us hope that if we work hard enough in this area, we will win a gold medal. Amen.